I'm Denton Davidson for Gold Derby with Oscar and Emmy nominee Judy Becker, the production designer for David O. Russell's latest film, Amsterdam. Judy, thanks for joining me today. And you've worked with David a lot on films like Joy and Silver Linings Playbook. And of course, you got your Oscar nomination for American Hustle. What keeps bringing you back to David O. Russell? What do you enjoy most about working with him? I think he belongs to that very small group of very imaginative and very distinctive filmmakers who is an auteur and also is really dedicated to making good films um, and not to just churning out popcorn movies. And that's kind of where my heart is at. And it's why I went into production design. So I feel really lucky that I met him it's like almost, it's more than 15 years ago and we've been working together ever since. And um, I get a chance to work with a lot of other directors because he doesn't make a movie every year, but um, it's been, a, I think we, you know, it's been a great working relationship and I've gotten to do a lot of very different and interesting things. What were your first thoughts when you discussed Amsterdam? It's sort of this comedic thriller. It takes place from 1918 to the early 1930s. So what yeah. went through your head with that? And my first thought was where we're going to shoot it because it took place in New York. And um, they were saying we were going to shoot in New York. But in my experience, most movies end up not shooting in New York because of the nature of the tax incentive. But my second more creative thought was about the artwork because Valerie um, was always an artist in the script from, um, from when we first started talking about it. That was one of the things David was really interested in. And I felt that it would be really important to get, not only get the art right for the period, but to have the input of, a, of a, some professional artist who could help generate the artwork and help advise on the artwork. Um, because I think often, sadly, in movies, um, when a character is an artist, it's often left to the last minute and then stuff is churned out and it's not that believable sometimes. So I wanted to make sure the artwork in this movie was really believable for the character and for the time period. Where did you end up filming? Los Angeles for New York <laughs> in the 1930s. Because <laughs> we see that New York space. And one of, the, one of the coolest, I think, areas is that New York right outside that region theater. And it's in the 1931, I believe. Um, and it's just, it just, it's magical to, to see that on the screen. What, what went into that design? A lot. Um, well, we, we shot all of the New York streets on the Paramount back lot. And um, that was in the beginning, it, it, that was chosen for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of them had to do with COVID and with the ability to close it off for a long period of time. And, and of course that was also a cost factor too. And at first I was, scared and nervous and disappointed because back lots can really look like back lots and you see that back lot I've, I've worked on that back lot before it's not that big you see it all the time but what was great ultimately really great about it was that we had a lot of time and a lot of freedom to do whatever we wanted to the streets and not only for one iteration of the streets but because our the street space was not that enormous. We changed it over into different streets and completely changed the set dressing. For example, the marquee is there, but the first time we see it is when they're exiting the hospital where they do the autopsy and that's the same building. So we transformed that building from hospital exterior to cinema. And it was really fun. Um, I really did a lot of street signage and dressing that to, to an extent I've never been able to do before because every, most other streetscapes I've shot have been uh, in real places. And there's just so long you can buy off businesses for on, on the kinds of movies I do. And um, so you don't, you know, it's never enough time to really do everything. And in, in that scope to like so many storefronts and so many businesses. So I have to say that I, um, one of my favorite stories from that was I, there was a big corner building um, and right across from Harold's office. And I dressed it like a men's clothing store and I used reference for the signage. And, but I also included my grandfather's name because he had a men's clothing store around that time period. And, um, 
And so I put back Lewis Wolf Becker was his name. And I've never put my name in anything, but I really love the idea of something from that time period being accurate for my family. And suddenly like everybody wanted their name on a store, like the producers and David. So we kind of, we hadn't finished designing all the signage yet. So we had Budman, Matthew Budman was a producer. We had Budman General Store. And I think we had Katagas Fish Market. And I know I put David's name on something, but I might've used his original pre Ellis Island family name. So I can't remember which one it was. And you can't, you don't see many of them in the final cut of the movie, but it was a really kind of bonding and fun thing to do. I love that story. That makes me want to go watch it again and, and pay real close attention. Um, yeah. Indoors in the offices and in the, in the homes, we see like a lot of wallpaper, draped curtains. What are some of the signatures of that era that you wanted to make sure that you captured? Um, I like wallpaper because it was used a lot in, especially in that period. And you can make a home look older or newer, depending on what type of wallpaper you choose. Like for Bert's office, even though the set, well, that was a set that we built. And even though this, he was in the office in the thirties, we picked earlier wallpaper for some of the rooms. So it had seemed like he'd been there a long time. And in Valerie's Amsterdam apartment, I got some really great sort of constructivist wallpaper just that was only available in very small quantities. So we used it very sparingly. And from, from Europe, that was European wallpaper. So we used some of that there. And um, it, doesn't, it doesn't obviously tell a story, but I always feel that touches like that give added reality to the sets and added depth to it. So the, I don't really want the audience to be aware, 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 but hopefully it's making it all feel real and right for the story. Um, Val, um, what's her name? <sighs> Beatrice, Beatrice's apartment was, I don't think we used any wallpaper there. We weren't allowed to do much with that house. We could paint it. And I wanted her apartment to look much more fashionable and up to date because she was a young, rich woman. And um, she, I thought would be the most fashionable and art deco-y of everybody. So that's where we brought that what was then contemporary style into the look. And there's so many different spaces. Uh, one of the most glamorous houses is Libby and Tom's, which Anya Taylor Joy and Robbie Malik play. What were your influences and favorite things about creating that space? And is that something you built or is that a, is that a, a no, that's a real, or how does that work? It's a real mansion, uh, the interior, you mean, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a real mansion. We, we actually built very little for, uh, you know, from scratch for this movie, but um, that was a real mansion. It's on um, West Adams it, and I shot there before and I actually had suggested it. I mean, the location manager was the one who introduced me to it originally. We shot there for Ratchet, and it's a pretty great space and they're very open to filming. And it's one of the oldest mansions in Los Angeles and it's now um, the Peace Awareness Center. And what's great about it is the downstairs has barely been touched since it was built. So it has that beautiful staircase and the huge entrance way and like a salon to the right. And what they use as a dining room to the left, which became Valerie's room, her nest. And it took a long time because we wanted to find something that worked interior and exterior. And it was anything that worked for the exterior was too renovated on, on the interior. So. Um, we only shot the interior there and it worked out well for lighting actually. And one of the things I really loved about doing that set was this idea that less looks like more money. Um, yeah. So that in that huge foyer, I think in a bourgeois household, you might have, and because we tried this thought, a big center table with flowers on it. But for them, because they have so much money and they have so much space and they can afford to just have this whole beautiful empty space with the staircase work very dramatically, um, which I think it does very well in the film. So that was something that I did a little bit of in Carol with a sort of rich minimalism in Carol and continued maybe even more so in, in Amsterdam with this set. Um, and then 
to the left was the dining room. And it was scripted that Valerie had a kind of room or workshop or bedroom that was very close to the foyer. And I always, when I do artwork or when I'm prepping for a movie, I always sit at the dining room table. I mean, I do live in New York, so there's not that many options, but it is my favorite. I like to sit in a kind of spacious area with a big table. And, um, and I went into the dining room and I said, she should be in here. Like, this is what she would take over. Like she would take over this room and do her artwork in here. And we took the dining room table out, but it was the same idea. Like she had a big desk and we set up, sort of set it up so that she could walk all around it and get to all her artwork and her belongings and her materials that way. And I did draw on my own experience of creating art for that, um, for that set and for the Amsterdam set as well. And it, that was, it was really fun. And it was really fun seeing everyone's expressions when they walked into the room because it was pretty great looking. So. And then you have not so glamorous places as well, like the military hospital and, and Bert's office. What, what's the most difficult thing about those spaces or, or what goes into creating that sort of look? Bert's office, because we were building it, it was a total pleasure. And I, I mean, I did a lot of research on, um, I was influenced a lot by a, a period location I've shot in, in uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, that's got, it's a beautiful, old office building with all the original woodwork and connecting rooms that you can sort of make an office as big or as small as you want. And we had originally, we had originally planned to shoot the movie in Boston and we had been prepping it there um, before COVID shutdown happened. And so with that in mind, I designed the set for Burt's office sort of influenced by that actual building with um, an old office building with a lot of woodwork and, um, and connecting rooms. And in fact, it's not really visible, but I like the idea that the rooms become progressively smaller until you get to his tiny bedroom at the back. Um, so it's a little bit like a telescope. And we did that and it really to show that his personal life is null in, in the film, but his work life is, is where all of his energy goes and his, and his creating new drugs life because we had a big pharmacy in there. <laughs> Um, but I have, a, I have a really great team that I work with in LA uh, who worked with me on Amsterdam. Lars, Lars is my construction coordinator who I adore and Alex Way, my art director, and, and they did great work and I was really happy with it. And there were just some fun things like we built glass shelves and then put those bottles through them so that you could get kinds of reflections of the bottles and into the front office um, with the curved window. And it really, it wasn't hard, it was just fun. And I'd had a long, long time to research because I'd started prepping in the fall of 2019 and we were gonna shoot in 2020 and then we didn't shoot till the fall of 2020. So all that time was made use of in um, getting reference for what really the real doctor's offices and exam rooms, et cetera, would have looked like at the time. Like I'm always mesmerized by just how much stuff goes into a production design in this in the set decoration. And you know, when do you know when to stop and and how to begin? And like, because you have like every binder on every desk and like a yeah. pencil. So how do you how that's I guess good, yeah, nerve wracking is that to just sort of be like, okay, that's enough. That's enough. Yeah, it's not. It's actually I usually take away. So I find that. Um, uh, uh, you know, most of the decorate, I work with like, well, I, I work with at the moment now two really excellent set decorators and Patty Kucha was my decorator on Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And I worked with her only in Canada before. And she's really, really great at finding period details. So I wasn't, we always confer, we talk about the look, we look at pictures, she shows me fabrics, she shows me the, for the main furniture, I want to see pictures of everything. We talk about the styles, we talk about um, you know, what's going to be heavily dressed and what is going to be more minimal. So we go over that during prep and it's, you know, a pretty, it's a, it's a long process. I, and usually there's particular things that are harder to find than others, like, um, the desk for Vos in his office. It's got to be very impressive. It doesn't have, in a, in a set like Bert's office, it's easier to find something because it's not well to do and it, there's no one standout piece of furniture. But 
often in a rich man's office, there's a standout desk that's got to fit the proportions of the room. So something like that will get an early start on um, searching for. But usually I let, you know, the decorator and the, and the set dressers and the lead man dress the set. And then I come in and um, can go through a couple of rounds of tweaking it. But one of the main things I do is take away because I do, I like it when there's enough so that I can take away and, and not have to add. And um, I don't, I really don't like overdress sets, especially for period films, yeah. which I've now done many, many of because um, people just didn't have that much stuff at the time. So yeah. it's, you know, which I've researched a lot and up until I'd say through the seventies, it was really people like, even though mass production had started, people were a lot more careful about how many possessions they bought and what they were. And, and it, and it's, so it's really fascinating. And when I see in a period piece, a lot, a lot of set dressing, I just, it just feels off to me um, because there was a spareness to the way people lived. I'd like to do something 18th century where people really had nothing. I mean, when you look at their, like their wills, it's like my, my cooking pot goes to so-and-so. I actually did study this and my, wow mattress goes you know like they had like 10 things um, and all really useful so as time goes on people accumulate more and rise of the middle class etc but it's still something that i really like to be cognizant of because i think it's really important for feeling the realism of the period and the characters i spoke with the costume designer recently jr habaker and she told me there were some last minute scenes that came up in production that she had to quickly turn around designs for was that the case for you as well, or did they always, have um, <laughs> It's it's always a thing with David. Is gets very very um, inspired once we start shooting. He really comes alive, and that's I think one of the reasons that in his films there's so much energy between the actors, and there's so much great humor and choreography because it he is it's wonderful to watch him directing. Uh, uh, you know, in front of the camera. So he gets ideas and he wants to implement them. And I actually, I've, I've seen this happen on every movie I've done with him, but especially uh, even with The Fighter, um, not as much on Silver Linings, but definitely a lot on American Hustle. I mean, some of the sets that are really featured in the film were like done that day, literally. I'm not even joking. And, you know, they're a really huge set, like, um, well, like Bert's office, you know, that's planned. So it's, or any of the really, or the Vos mansion, you, it would be hard to do that at the last minute, but there were definitely things that came up almost every shooting day. So I had an art, I had an onset art director, which I've never had before um, to help facilitate all of those things. And, um, and then I would have someone from the set deck department working with her. And, you know, he, it's not that he asks for a completely dressed, department store room that we have to shoot that afternoon. It's it's smaller things, um, but still, if you're not expecting it, it can be daunting. And I told everyone to expect it because I knew it would happen. And I made sure we had extra set dressing on the truck and you know a painter always on set. So I tried to prepare as well as we could for it. Um, and I think it went pretty smoothly. I never got any like late night emergency calls. So that's always a good thing. And just one quick last question that I always like to ask anyone I haven't interviewed before, just because I just love hearing everyone's own story, but how did you end up in production design for film and television? Was this always your goal? Like, uh, you it know, was or... never, I didn't even know about it when I started working. I mean, I started working in film after college and um, my cousin worked in film and she said, well, maybe you'd like it because you like art and which I did. I liked art and movies and design and all of those things. But I didn't really know much about it. And she said, you should work in the art department. So I started working in the art department as a PA and um, right at the bottom and worked my way up over years and took a break in the middle and then went back to it. And it was at that point that I realized I really wanted to be a production designer because it, I, it, I don't know why it took me so long to realize this, but it brought all of my interests together. I mean, literally. Um, interior design which I'd been interested since uh, in since I was about five years old my mother was really interested in it so she would show me things and we'd talk about it art um film um decorating color 
all of these things that I'd always spent a lot of time with when I was a kid, building things, those were my obsessions. And if someone had said to me then, you're, you know, you were born to be a production designer, I probably would have become a lawyer because I was always contrary. <laughs> so, so I'm glad it worked out the way it did. But I think that I have, I think that it's really important for anyone who wants to do it to a have those sources of interest and inspiration that that motivate you and that keep you loving your work and two to have a lot of experience in the film business before you really start working at at the level where you're leading a big team of people because you you make a lot of mistakes and fortunately I made them before I became a designer so and I learned a lot I think one of the films I learned the most on was when I was a set dresser for Malcolm X, Spike Lee's movie. And, mm -hmm. and um, I became the hardware buyer for the set decoration team. And I learned that there were no um, Phillips head screws in the 1940s. Like I learned little things like that. And I learned how authentic, how you make everything look really authentic. And those kinds of lessons that you learn when you really have no power are the ones that stay with you. And I think are great lessons. So um, that's, that's how I did it. I love started that. taking out garbage and wrangling pigeons I'm not kidding <laughs> that's why I love that question I, I just love yeah. those stories. um and it certainly worked out for you you're an Oscar and Emmy nominated success and I'm sure there's more to come um I'm going to tell our viewers to head over to our website uh goldderby.com make your predictions for the Oscars and all the other other upcoming awards that are coming and Judy best of luck to you with everything and it was a pleasure to speak with you about thanks your it was a pleasure for me as well thank you bye